The time-honored tradition of defining career development exclusively in terms of promotions, moves, title changes is dead. Don't panic. Let's have ourselves a pocket-sized pep talk because my guest today believes there are so many other ways that employees can and want to grow. Curious? So am I. A pocket-sized pep talk podcast that can help energize your business and your life with a quick, inspiring message. Now, here's your host, Rob Jollis. Today's guest, Julie Winkle Giulioni, is a champion for workplace growth and development and helps executives and leaders optimize talent and potential within their organizations. One of Inc. Magazine's top 100 speakers, she's the author of Promotions Are So Yesterday, and the co-author of the international bestseller, Help Them Grow or Watch Them Go, translated into seven languages. Julie is a regular columnist for Training Industry Magazine and Smart Brief and contributes articles on leadership, career development, and workplace trends to numerous other publications. I am thrilled to have her with us, and it took us a while to get her, but glad to have you on the show. Welcome, Julie. Thank you, Rob. And I am thrilled to be here. Yay. Well, we're going to have a party. So let's jump right in. And I want to start with the promotions, moves, and title changes are dead. That did shake me up. Okay. Why? So it's intended to be a bit provocative. And um, dead might be a little bit of an overstatement, but they're definitely dead as an exclusive way of thinking about career development, progression, satisfaction, engagement in the workplace. So, you know, for some time now, the world's been changing. Hierarchies are breaking down, mid layers of management are sort of being um, pulled out. Work is getting done more organically. Um, my dog is digging in the background, which has huge workplace implications. <laughs> Anyway, the world's changing. And um, and then we as individuals, you know, you think about the last three years and what many of us have been through, you know, having to look mortality in, in the face and really get clear on what's important, you know, what our priorities are. Yeah. All of this is converging to create a really different set of circumstances uh, in terms of workplace growth and engagement. And yet, when we think about career development, we just sort of default back or kind of rubber band back to this idea of climbing the corporate ladder, um, which just, you know, is is available to fewer and fewer today. And so the, the basic idea here is how can we expand the definition to more appropriately align with today's workplace and what's really possible? Yeah, and I'm glad you're bringing it up because, you know, when I was at Xerox, you know, I was kind of fighting that corporate ladder and trying to go up that corporate ladder and frustrated by the corporate ladder. And uh, it was, and there was some, always some confusion as to the criteria of the corporate ladder anyway. So uh, it's, you know, I think what I really craved was recognition, um, not necessarily a title change of which I always felt there was a lot of stinginess there too, but, but the, both of them kind of confused me and uh, I really thought I'd I'd be a zeroid forever, and I can tell you that uh, you know I'll be April will be thirty years since I left and became an entrepreneur. But that was the single biggest thing. It was it was kind of confusion about recognition and promotion and all that. So I'm glad you're you're writing to this. Yeah, you know what? And I think that dissonance, that confusion has just perpetuated itself over these last three decades. Um, you know, the, the idea of it being a ladder is kind of silly. I don't know how we ever got to the ladder metaphor because we know organizations are pyramids. You know, so there's far fewer and uh, opportunities and they're farther between as you move up the, the food chain. And what I'm finding through my research is not everybody aspires to that. And yet it's kind of our default or an exclusive way of defining success. And so it does, it creates real confusion for folks. Yeah. You know where else I found that, Julie? I in terms of being a manager, when I when I mentor people uh, who go, well, you know, I'm doing this, so I guess then I have to move into management. It's sort of the same thing. It's like, no, I'm, I, I was a manager at Xerox too. Wasn't my cup of tea. 
<laughs> I, I, you know, I learned that um, I'm really good at managing me. I'm a pretty good hunter. Uh, I put so much faith in loyalty and, you know, the Santa Claus and the Easter Bunny too, that when not everyone had the same definition, it broke my heart. And I had a good mentor who took me aside and said, not, you know, it, not everybody just moves to management. That's not necessarily part of that ladder you're talking about. You can be really good and happy at what you do and still grow and and and, and feel encouraged by by your career. But to tell people that we're not all cut out to be managers either, sort of the same thing, at least for me. Yeah, it's so important. I can't tell you how many people I've talked to who aspire to move into management or leadership. And when I ask why, you know, what are you looking forward to? It's just like deer in a headlight. They don't know. (laughs) It's just a a reflexive response to culture, expectations, all sorts of things that just have us kind of moving without thinking sometimes uh, in a a direction that is not in any way aligned with what we love or what we're good at. Right. And we're going to get to this in a couple of minutes because I have a pet peeve about how we train our managers, but I want to hold that thought because we're not doing anybody any favors when they get there sometimes. But uh, we're really lined up on this thing. I wish more people understood that uh, you can have a fabulous career uh, and not necessarily have the title of a manager uh, and, and very re- rewarding. And it just there's just so much else out there. But all right, well, so let's talk about some alternatives. So we're it's not all about rung after rung, go up the ladder. Uh, matter of fact, a quick funny story for me, but I remember writing this in a, in a blog of how I had to almost teach myself to not put my hand on the ladder. Like I was climbing as an entrepreneur and it was costing me creating some dysfunction with my family and things like that. But I only knew one way and it was, I thought it was up. Uh, You know, nobody taught me that you don't have to grab every rung, but let's talk about some alternatives. So, so maybe, maybe we don't grab the next rung on that ladder or, or we're not, uh, uh, you know, immediately promoted. What else do we offer? people to to keep them engaged and keep them excited about what they're doing. Yeah, yeah. And the the beauty is there is so much beyond and between and beside that ladder. So over the last 10 years or so of working with organizations around the world, when I talk to people about what their careers meant to them, what was really important The answers were all over the board. Sure, a few people said, you know, moving up the ladder, getting that sense of of recognition that comes with the corner office and and all of that. But far more people were talking about making a difference, doing something that left the world better, the connections, the real friendships and relationships and community that came out of work, Um, building skills, having this, this opportunity for lifelong learning and testing their metal and pushing the limits of their capacity, developing their talents. You know, they were talking about this wide range of things that went way beyond the the structural expectation of the next run. And so as I listened carefully, the ideas started to bucket themselves into these eight categories. It ultimately became the eight dimensions of the multidimensional career framework. So the alternatives to the climb, and it's one of the dimensions, you know, as much as, as I say, it's, you know, so yesterday, it's today, it's tomorrow, it'll be, you know, forever. It's as part of the structure of organizations, but it's one of a whole constellation of Uh, dimensions and ways that we can express ourselves, engage and grow and develop, and that managers and organizations can leverage to help us do the same thing. So sorry, that was a really long preamble to your question, which was, what are the others? Right. And so the research that we did um, was really quite stunning. I have to say It, it blew me away when I developed the framework sent it out. We did about 800 uh, folks internationally across ages, genders, levels. And what we found was the number one dimension, the thing that they were more interested in than anything else in aggregate was contribution. People Mm -hmm. have, you know, and and we know this, I mean, this isn't news. I mean, the human soul and spirit has a need to express itself and contribute and make a difference and be of service and live on purpose. Um, But knowing that and knowing that in aggregate, it is the most interesting of all of the dimensions, 
is really helpful, hopeful information for managers everywhere. Because what manager wouldn't welcome someone making more contribution? Right. And the key is, how do we use that strategically so it's not a one-way street, but where that person is getting value too beyond the engagement, even in terms of developing. So as I step up and I do more, I'm growing new skills. I'm expanding my network. I'm adding new experiences to my portfolio. So it becomes a really um, synergistic sort of way of thinking about engagement and development. Right. Can you give me an example of, uh, and this is, I, I did some reading on you. This this is part of the the string of C's, lots of C's. You, you like the letter C, do you? I like alliteration. <laughs> okay. We'll, we may get to a few more of them. Don't worry. But this is, um, I, I was looking at, can you give me an example of, of uh, or two of contribution? Yeah. So, I mean, there are folks who, might have in the past been interested in climbing the corporate ladder so that they could have more influence, so they could make a bigger impact. And yet that's not what's necessary. You don't need to be in a new office or with a new business card. I don't know if we even use business cards anymore, but a new title in order to make a greater impact. So to recognize that contribution is really driving me and find a way to have that greater impact, whether it's you know taking on a new assignment within the scope of one's role, stepping in for someone who might be on leave, taking on maybe some tasks that your manager, um, you know, typically does, Um, starting an employee engagement group, taking on an initiative to make, you know, a, a social impact within the organization are all ways that we can express that need for contribution we right. can feel that sense of, of achievement that comes with that greater impact and possibly even learn and grow in the process. Yeah. Okay. So th- there you get it. You, you know, I was, I was nibbling away at that way. I, I think part of the problem is it's like, we, you know, like a car, you know, it don't all start, we put in another battery, but that doesn't necessarily fix what happened with the car. Sometimes it's the alternator that's taking the battery power out of that battery. And so we, we're not really fixing the problem. We're just delaying it. I think one of the problems I've always had is just how we even teach managers who are, you know, kind of in place for many reasons, but one of them is to mentor these people that you're talking about and and to be looking for those contributions. And I remember I was trained by a company called Zenger Miller, and we looked at 25 management, ah, I see your eyes opening up on that one, uh, 25 different management pieces. But my favorite two were recognition because they really struggled understanding what that was about and how to do it properly. And it was so damaging to people. And the other was delegation. And I think we're sort of on your contribution, contribution, we're sort of nibbling at both of those kind of, if we had somebody who knew how to delegate and understood a process for recognition, we might be getting at that one. Oh my gosh. Well, you are just making my heart sing, Rob. I've got to tell you, I worked for Zenger Miller and I developed some of those training programs. Oh, they're great. They were great. They've stayed with oh, me this whole time. Hey. I still, I, Julie, I still have the, um, I loved it so much. You said business cards are, are dying, but I love the little cards that I got in a nice it's little book. It, folks, if you can imagine, you think business cards are going out. Many years ago, we would take business cards and put them in their own little book. And so there were little sleeves for each business card. And what Zenger Miller did was they took each process, because I love that. They processed everything. You want performance review? We got a process for it, whatever. <laughs> but I had that booklet, and it really helped me as a job aid, as a manager, understanding and working with people. So big Zenger Miller fan, loved yeah. it, and still use some of the things that I learned Oh, so many years ago. Oh, so many years ago. Yeah, it was a a great company and really some great training that I think um, set the stage for a whole generation, really, of managers. Um, So thank you for the little walk down memory lane there. Um, I I think you've nailed it, you know, and I hadn't really thought about it, but you've processized um, this even further, I think. I think it is the combination of delegation, maybe maybe the first step in the process is really having the kind of trusting, authentic relationship with an employee to where they're willing to share with you and you have an understanding of what's driving them, what their interests and motivations are. Uh, But then once you've got that information on the table, 
delegation is really kind of at the core of what's involved in terms of figuring out. So if this person wants this experience, where can we find that? You know, where are there the opportunities, the activities, the initiatives, the voids, the special projects, whatever they might be? And then how do we make a match there and set the goals and set the process in place and help people with the support that they need and remove the roadblock, create the the runway for that development to happen? And then to your point, the recognition, oh my gosh, you know, it takes almost no time. It takes almost nothing beyond some sincere attention to what's going on with folks. And that kind of recognition is just gold in terms of, of helping to keep people focused and motivated on their development goals. Yeah. You know, I, as a, as a salesman and as a sales trainer, you know, everybody wants to talk about objections and, you know, we work reactively, but I like to look at objections proactively as, okay, so so what causes that problem? Again, why is the battery losing power? And I think one of the, the issues in um, recognition is that because managers aren't trained in it, and they, they are locked into the thought that everybody just wants more money and that somehow this will haunt them. That if they that if they've got somebody who isn't necessarily a superstar, and oh my goodness, those are the ones we're really looking for, folks. The superstars, they kind of get it. Uh, but but they do one or two things extremely well. It could just be getting to their desk at 8 a.m. every morning, but by golly, there she is. There he is. Uh when we when we teach them, we you just have to be more specific with the recognition, number one. A, do you think they're going to be late tomorrow morning? And B, just creates a wonderful environment for other conversations. And not a, if only you could do this better, but I mean, how can I help make your job better conversation? But the other thing real fast is, and I, I still keep it in my, my, my bag, is I've got uh, 25 other ways to recognize people that has nothing to do with money. And your book is so timely because- it also doesn't have anything to do with a promotion. It has to do with a human need, the way I see it. Absolutely. Those intrinsic motivations are so powerful. And, you know, employees today have a real need to feel seen and heard yeah. and valued. And a few words, and you nailed it, Rob. I mean, it's that specificity, knowing exactly what it is you're focusing in on and being really strategic about uh, naming that, labeling that. That specificity is what makes the the recognition really sing. Right. And protects the manager in all fairness to them. If a manager says, Julie, I just want to bring you and tell you you're amazing. Well, then, yeah, in three months, Julie has her performance review, if we're still doing those. Uh, <laughs> those will be yesterday too, by the way. But, but when we have a performance review, there is some confusion. I thought I was doing it. If we're specific and we're not doing it to trick anybody, every we can, everybody's protected, so to speak. But again, it, you, you fall back to that alternator. Uh, I don't think we're training uh, people in those positions to understand what to look for, how to, how to look for it, how to recognize it. And then for goodness sakes, as you said, we want to give them more responsibility, how to set it up properly so you can step back and let them make a couple, maybe bump their nose a little bit, but get it right. They'll get there. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you know, I think a, a couple of things are operating. Uh, in many organizations, the best individual technical performer is tapped to be the manager or the leader of the group. And we know that the skills and the sensibilities don't necessarily align. So sometimes we're promoting people into those roles who don't have an interest and don't have the the you know the DNA to to want to do that. But then the other thing is, you know, if we're not training managers, it's really hard to hold them accountable for what are sophisticated skills that have huge implications for the organization. So we owe it to managers to give them some pretty intensive um development experiences um, because we've got so much riding on them. Yeah. Oh, I totally agree with you. All right. Let's jump back to the book for a second here. Cause I tell you what, we could stay there forever. That's a, that's a hot topic for me too, but 
you know, I, 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 I'm, I'm not going to, I really, I really love pocket sized pep talks, but if I came up with another, another podcast, it would be called a, a book finds you because we don't find a book. It finds us typically. So tell me sort of how you came up with the model. How, how did this book find you? I'm, I'm sensing a story. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, it's interesting. So the the standard story I tell, I will share first, and then I'm going to share something that I just discovered. Okay. So uh, about 11 years ago, I was invited to co-author a book with Beverly Kay. Mm-hmm. And that book was Help Them Grow or Watch Them Go. And it was really focused on helping managers engage in more meaningful career conversations. It was about expanding the conversation. We had a, a whole have a whole uh, conversational framework in there and really help managers think more organically about how to slip development just, you know, kind of into and around the, the conversations, the interactions, the, the work that folks are doing. And it's great, um, a really great framework, really well received. I've done training around the world based upon it. And although managers leave feeling like, okay, I can have a better conversation, there was still, I was hearing from managers, a lot of reluctance that, yeah, it could be a better conversation, but, you know, people are still going to want that promotion. And that's the one thing I can't give them. So maybe it's just better to avoid this altogether. And so, um, so for the last 10 years, as I've kind of heard that continued little bit of pushback, I was thinking, oh, there's a sequel here. Although we don't want to say sequel because we know what that means, Um, at least in the theaters. So that was what started. And I found myself starting to build some tools and some thoughts around it. And then suddenly, you know, in looking at all of the the field research, it it just became clear that there was really a a framework that needed to be um, crafted around it. And so that became the multidimensional career framework. I wrote about it in a blog post and an editor picked it up and said, ooh, that could be a book. And I said, okay, sign me up. Interesting. So that was standard story. What I didn't realize until last week, I was doing another podcast interview and the interviewer said, you know, what you're saying sounds so much like this book that I read or the themes were so much like this book that I read like 30 years ago called Hope for the Flowers. And it was just like your Zinger Miller moment. It just my eyes got big because that was a book I remember my mom gave me probably 30 years ago, 40 years ago. And it basically it's it's a children's book that's not a children's book that you know, basically speaks to these caterpillars discovering that climbing up doesn't get them anywhere they want to go. And they need to make a leap and become a a butterfly. And I realized in talking with her during that interview, that was actually probably the first seed of this book. Mm. And without being aware of it, that was what kind of grew and blossomed into this whole point of view. So it's been a a weird kind of week going back in time and and figuring out what, you know, kind of tracing that back to its source. Yeah, that's kind of cool. I, you know, I, uh, I had a, a sales book that I wrote that I really loved, and I had a publisher always after me, like, "Can we get another one out of you?" And I went. I even had another edition where I wrote the very first line: "I haven't changed my mind," and that, that was how I opened up the, the book. I love it. But I, again, yeah, I freshened a few things up. Uh, but it was the same thing. I got an email from somebody who was actually thanking me because they had made a really big sale, but they felt that they were being mean. Um, because they were asking tougher questions and it, mm. and it, it actually bothered me to an extent of, I just felt like I failed them, but I, I wrote a piece called it, you know, it's not mean it's merciful and just how asking tougher questions and, you know, creating, you know, it, with as much empathy as possible, but creating some pain in a conversation ends up being a very merciful conversation, mm. but it's the same sort of thing. I, and I, that's what I mean in terms of how books find us. It's sort of the oddest little weird things that people can trigger. That's why people like you and me, we love engaging in workshops. We love talking to people because as I'm talking, I'm, I'm going, just give me one second. <laughs> That's a block. You know, I, I got to get that down. If I, if I, if I'm in a closet, I can't have that conversation. I'm not quite, you know, I don't come up with many good ideas. I come up with them from talking to people who are reading and talking about us. It's, very unusual. And working out there, trying right. to sort this 
stuff out. Yeah, that's really where the sparks start flying. Uh, quick, th- this is just a, a little side question. Was that your favorite? Because I, I got my favorite kid book. Was that your favorite book as a kid when you were growing up? Did you have one that you well, just... First yeah. of all, may I just say thank you for thinking that 30 or 40 years ago I was a kid. <laughs> so no, I was that was a, a favorite adult book. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, go back, go back to being a kid. Was there you one know, that stuck with you? Yeah, the story of the little red hen, huh. which I'm very conflicted about today. I love that story. But, well, I kind of, you know, it's a little bit of a double. There's story. a little bitterness in there, by the way. <laughs> yeah, yeah, a lot. Um, and but I do really think that reading that I've got a real sense of conscientiousness. I'm diligent. I, you know, putting the seeds away all winter long. Uh, mm-hmm. Hopefully, I'm a little more generous than she is on the other end. Well, the gnome's helping her, as I recall. <laughs> you know, um, <laughs> you know, it's funny you bring that up. I haven't thought of that book forever. It's got to be in my top three. Mine, by the way, is. The little engine that could. I was blown away by that book yeah. as as a kid, and, and I was a little on the small side, and I you know got a hold of it, and I just um, I, I've always thought, I actually dedicated one of my books to somebody who brought who who brought that book to me, and it because it changed my life. Uh, the little engine that could. You know what, yeah. Rob? That is a perfect book for you. I, <laughs> that's that's just that's your book. It is my book. It is my book. That's <laughs> funny. All right. Uh, let's see. It, it, it's may, I'm loving our conversation, by the way. Uh, you know what I was reading about you? Um, and see if I got this right. In, in terms of this book, that there's um, you ask a lot of questions to spark reflection and dialogue. Uh, am, I, am I ringing a bell there? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Good. Yeah, I'm all about the questions. Good. So, um, and there's a lot of them, close to 100 of them. So I so I see. Can you cherry pick maybe two or three that that you think? And maybe it, you, you got to shape the shot. It fits the individual. But are there a couple that are just a, kind of special to you? Yeah, you know, um, the default question that so many leaders and managers ask when they're going to sit down and have a development conversation is, "Where do you see yourself in three to five years?" That just that's just yeah. you know. And, Oh, if I, you know, ask it one more time and and we've all done it, you know, we've all asked it. Um, And to me, that feels like the corporate equivalent of what do you want to be when you grow up? You know, it's so narrow and locks us in. So I really like the questions that are the antithesis of that, that don't talk about what people want to be when they grow up, but talk about what people want to do. You know, what do you want to do? What does success look like? Um, what kinds of customers do you want to work with or technologies or what do you want to achieve? What kind of a legacy do you want to leave? I mean, those sort of bigger questions that get people thinking about the stuff that's going to mean more to them. Um, and that also, you know, if I'm a manager, the fodder from those conversations can be used toward crafting a way to help people to grow, you know, right in the current role without having to go somewhere to be someone else to have a different title. So I like those kinds of questions, as well as questions around, you know, when somebody, when they go through the uh, multidimensional uh, career self-assessment, they find out, you know, I'm more interested in contribution or confidence or contentment or whatever it might be. Just that open question, what does fill in the blank contribution look like to you? What's it going to feel like when you're doing more of that? That just really helps, I think, people to get grounded and specific. And the more specific, kind of back to what we were talking about with uh, recognition, the more specific we are in those conversations, the more targeted the actions and the experiences and activities can be. Oh, I, I, I love that. I, and I have to tell you, without ever us having this conversation, my most disliked question, and I don't know if you know this, but I'm 13 years uh, mentoring and, and volunteering to help people in career transition. So I'm mocking interviews up all the time. My most disliked question is, where do you see yourself in three to five years? And I've always had this fantasy of, because of, I can't, of, of leaning across the table and go, I don't know. Where do you see yourself? three to five years. Why don't you give me your fairy tale and then I'll give you my fairy tale. Uh, 
But the question you're asking is honest. It's not a trap question. And um, it hel- if I'm on the other side, it helps me understand not just from a hiring perspective, but how to manage you pr- perspective. Because also the, the the worst managers I ever had were the ones that said, this is the, you know, this is who I am, conform to me or you're in trouble. Uh, and the greatest managers I ever had were the ones that said, I'm going to study you. I'm going to figure out what motivates and demotivates you. And I'm going to manage you tw- at that angle. Much like I coached a lot of basketball, much like a basketball coach when I got better at it, which was, no, I'm going to assess the talent I have, figure what inspires and motivates people. Sometimes it's a real push and sometimes it's not a real push, uh, mm-hmm. but to understand my team, yeah. my locker yeah. room. Yeah. The the best leaders, I really think, are the ones who are able to personalize the employment experience. Right. And those are the ones who are going to be able to, to keep talent. And, you know, back to that three to five year question. I mean, part of the problem with it is that we don't know where the world is going to be in three to five years. You know, there's that research from the um, Institute for the Future of Work. 85% of the jobs we'll be doing in 2030 haven't been invented. Wow. So how much, you know, hubris is there to say, well, in seven years, I will be doing X, Y, Z when who knows what we'll be doing, what right. and what AI will be doing for us. Yeah, that's interesting. I, I saw something one time from the financial industry of, they took the Fortune uh, top 50 companies and uh, they looked at them about 15 y- years later and like 30 of them weren't even in business anymore. And these were the top 50 companies. Just everything shifts, everything changes, which is why I find it to be almost a trite question of, okay, I'll give you what we're looking for and we can pretend. Yeah. But did you really learn anything from me just now I, other than I can invent things quickly? Uh, so yeah, we're on the same page there. All right, coming down the home stretch. Let's talk about we, we're just about ready to wrap up. And give me the name of the book again. Promotions are so yesterday. Yeah, and we on Am- development help employees thrive. Fantastic. And on Amazon, you have an author's page, correct? I do. Yes. Good for you. All right, you're better. Uh, and I saw at least eighty-seven reviews. I I count these things. Uh, so lots of nice reviews on there, some really great quotes on the book. And my audience knows that uh, buying the book is only half the deal. Uh, writing a review is what we really look for. It means a great deal to authors. And it actually means something to that Amazon algorithm that we're still trying to figure out at times. But um, So let's get a copy of that book at any online store um, um, and, um, and really um, do a nice thing. Read it and then write. Two sentences, three sentences. Don't worry about anything real long and wordy. We 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 can't get through those long ones either. Just something real short. Just say what it meant to you. And um, 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 Julie will be back in a moment because I'm doing a commercial. But the commercial is it means so much to authors that I don't think people understand. So let's get the book. Let's write a review on the book. And the last question for you, my friend, is some mentors, uh, mentors that maybe just gave you a little spark and got you going. Oh my goodness! Probably the the most significant of my business mentors, because you know, of course, I have family members who who really yeah. helped mold me. But a woman named Beverly Marsh was one of my first early bosses, and she she was an older woman. Yeah, you know, she was probably fifty at the time, <laughs> but to me, she seemed older oh. and elegant and wonderful. But Beverly had a capacity to see the best in everyone around her. You talk about recognition. This was a woman who just had this innate ability to be able to see what maybe you were a little fragile around, what needed that little bit of boost, what you saw maybe a little kernel of in yourself, but weren't quite sure about. She had the capacity to find that and somehow shine this golden light upon it that let it grow. And I I thrived in her presence. To this day, I have a friend who also worked under Beverly Marsh. And we talk about, you know, in a tough situation, what would Beverly do? <laughs> That's great. You know, I, I, it's, it's, I, I shouldn't allow myself to do this because we're talking about mentors and I'll throw Larry DeMoncasset's name out into the ring as a zeroid that really helped me. But relating to your topic, um, I got to go back to my dad. My dad was my scout leader 
I was a boy scout with six guys. We started a troop. Within two years, we had 120 boys in this troop. It was a very successful troop. But we had a motto that I guess he created. But I mean, it was a very serious motto among the leadership. And we would say it like all the time when we met. And the motto was, remember, boys, uh, when you're leading, don't go on and do it. Come on, let's do it. That was our our phrase. And it stayed with me. And I remember thinking, you know, there was some depth to that. And and as a, you know, as an 11 year old, um, I really understood it. And I was always looking for a way to, to get people to come on and do it, not go on and do it. And um, I still see a lot of these guys to this day, and they still bring that phrase up. It really uh, landed with us. So I'm bringing Lee Jollis back into the fold for this one. Oh, Mr. Jollis, we need like a little plaque or something with that. Yeah. That's beautiful. Yeah. Well, yeah, nice, nice, nice memory. He he had a lot of phrases. He was a Marine. Some of them were a little rough, with those <laughs> phrases. But all right, you, I have enjoyed the heck out of it. Uh, how do people uh, get a hold of you, learn more about what you're doing? Probably at my website, juliewinklejulioni.com. That's kind of my central repository of ideas and contact information. Good. And can they reach out to you on LinkedIn and stuff like that? Is that I okay? I love it. Yeah. Oh, good. Good. Really love it. Me Thank too. You. I get some people like, no, 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 I will not accept someone from LinkedIn. I won't accept you on Facebook. I got about, I've got a very few people there and I really don't want to hear about the marshmallow treat you had, but I do take LinkedIn seriously. And uh, as, as from uh, author to author, somebody's going to read my book and reach out. Uh, well, of course I'm going to welcome to them to the family. So I'm glad they can find you that way too. Folks, that's a that's an interesting spelling of the name. So when you look for Julie, it's Julie, but the last name G I U L I O N I, and I will have that on our site as well. So we'll be able to, to get that going. Um, although you could probably put that book in and uh, and find her even easier that way. So another reason why we'll chase that book down. All right, it has been a treat. It, it took a while for us to get this going, but it was every bit worth the wait thoroughly enjoyed talking to you and I'm, I'm grateful you came on oh thank you rob it's been a, just a delight wonderful well we'll do it again as well as we can next time everyone until then stay safe thanks so much for listening if you enjoyed today's show please rate and recommend it on itunes outcast or wherever you get your podcasts you can also get more information on this show and rob at jollis.com